I want to go back to your schooling. Were you, were you a brainiac, mate, or were you a bit of a jock? What were you? I could do well at school, but as I, in every report that I ever got that I needed to apply myself, yeah. needs to apply himself to his task. I kind of got a neck injury when I was 12, playing yeah. rugby league, and so I wasn't able to be a jock. I actually became a referee, which is the opposite yeah. of a jock, as it you is. know. Yeah. But yeah, all through school, I just, that's, school's where I kind of started singing. I just used to walk around singing, whoa, for the longest time. Which really? Is my favorite song of the time. Yeah, and then through that, I met up with a guy called Mick Turt, who, uh, he could play the guitar. Himself and I used to do a bit of just hanging out. There was a group of four or five of us, we'd just sing songs at lunchtime. And then that grew into myself and Mick going into Newcastle on weekends and busking. Put on on black and white minstrel makeup. Yep. Nothing culturally insensitive, simply so people didn't know who the hell we were and we wouldn't <laughs> be ridiculed at school. Yeah, so we made a little bit of money doing that. And then in year 10 or so, year nine or 10, we started putting on lunchtime concerts to raise money for certain things, like whether at the 40 hour famine, because we went to a Catholic school. So there was always uh, St. Vincent de Paul or something. Yep. And it was through that I sang at church in year nine mass, I think it was. Yep. And that's when Grant Wormsley and Frank Manita were a guitarist and drummer respectively asked me if I'd come and start what? singing with their band. That was, that's where my first foray into the music actually happened. So it was from going to Maris Brothers at Hamilton that it all yep. started. But what about the, uh, the 11, year old boy that won talent contest in Cardiff well that was just I've always I always loved singing and that was it was a Friday night disco family disco at Cardiff Workers Club you know a blue light and I think no and no, I was I had a band on and everything like a cabaret style band I went down with the Malone family my my parents weren't that big on me going to Cardiff Workers because that's where my brothers used to get into fights and stuff all the time uh, <laughs> uh, but we went down there and I got up with a guy called Paul Kerr yep. who was a year younger than me at school and we got up and sang The Monster's Holiday. And it was quite strange because the guy who backed us on piano, and I didn't know this till years later, his name was Gleason as well, no relation, but I ended up going to school with his son in year 11 and 12. Funny how that all happened. Wow, mate. Like, isn't it funny how it just all falls into place? It is. I mean, they're, they're, I know there's no... Well, is there a grand plan? I don't know. But but the, the way that things happen, things that click, in, wheels and cogs that click into place, over year, over the years, a great adventure, really, isn't it? I absolutely agree. And I, look, I don't think there is a grand plan, but I do believe is that you make the most of your opportunities and you take every opportunity that you can. And you've done that, Gleeson. Yeah, I've been very lucky. As I say, I, I, I didn't have any plans of uh, of getting involved in music or being famous or anything like that as a kid. Come from a big family. I was going to follow my brother into the police force and do that. I mean, up until 12, I thought I was going to play for Saints. <laughs> then I got the neck injury started refereeing yep. won a few awards as a referee refereed with guys that went on to become first grade referees <laughs> Paul McBlain you're yep. to say Paul McBlain anymore he, he left in a blaze of glory you <laughs> said it Paul McBlain blaze of glory <laughs> When you formed the Screaming Jets in 89, the boys from school, was it, let me have a look, he was a Grant that, that went across with you to, to join? Grant was the first guy that, that ever said, do you want to be in a band? We were in Aspect, our first band together for three and a half years. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan. We actually had a fight over that name because well, we called ourselves Sudden Impact at the start because it was right when that movie had come out. Clint Eastwood, it was. Dirty um, Harry. Dirty Harry, yeah. Oh. So I was a huge fan and we called ourselves Sudden Impact and we did our first gig at the end of year 10 at the Highfields Azuri Club where our drummer's father was a board member. I actually got driven there by me mum in my referee's gear after a game and we pulled up and there was people for days and I said oh mum you have to go around here around the back so I can change out of my clothes. I didn't want everyone to see that I was doing referee, referee stuff. <laughs> How cool can you be? Anyway, that show went nuts. It was an absolute, the, the place was a bit of a write-off. Yeah. And then soon after that, school holidays started. So we were up in Foster, God's Beautiful country. Foster time. Almost, 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 almost the southwest rocks, mate. That whole stretch of coast, I reckon, from Seal Rock up to Coffs Harbour is yeah. just, that's God's country. There's sure, no other right. words for it. So we're in Foster. I walk past a newsstand and there's a, a news agent and there's the banner sheet out the front. Sudden impact, make it big. And I'm like, what? 
what's happened while we've been away? Well, it turns out that that was the year that a bunch of year 12 students from Wollongong High School yep. had stolen the answers to the HSC. So the whole year, that, that whole year 12, were told that they weren't allowed to have their HSC because they didn't know how who had got the answers and cheated on the exam. So right. this band did a song called I Want My HSC. I want my HSC. Die Straight song. And they were called Sudden Impact. So right. immediately Sudden Impact was off the table as our name. And we went through weeks of trying to come up with a name. And Grant's then girlfriend, I think, came up with the name Aspect. And I hated it. Didn't like her much either. For the Screaming Jets. Who named the Screaming Jets? Well, that happened because we'd come from Aspect. Uh, Paul, our bass player, had come from a band called The Embers. Yep. Brad Heaney had come from a band called Deviate, who were a big, pretty big band in Newey at the time. And we just got together and started rehearsing in this room. And then that had progressed to getting gigs. And we didn't have a name. We'd all written sheets and sheets of names and no one had agreed on anything. Anyway, we were out the front of the rehearsal room. And just like I was saying before, that I used to sit, walk around singing, whoa. Uh, I just used to walk around singing. There was people that called me Elvis. Uh, not because I sang Elvis songs, but because I was just singing all the time. Anyway, I was singing a song called I Heard the Screaming Jets by a guy called Johnny Warman. I heard the screaming jets. And Brad Heaney, our drummer at the time, said, what about that for a name? And we're all like, kind of, what? What name? He goes, the Screaming Jets. And we all kind of looked at each other and, wow, well, that's, that's not a bad name. Right. Because at that time... I looked down on the ground and I found a small, let's just say, a package of contraband. Oh, yes. And the name was sealed from that time on. In the beginning, there was no V and okay. no G. So it was just called Screaming Jets. Got a bit classy and called it the Screaming Jets. <laughs> so, yeah, that it came out very organically and uh, all thanks to Brad Heaney. When you first started, you're very infamous for having a few raucuses and sometimes, you know, pretty uh, tough shows, mate. Yes, yeah, so I, I, <laughs> I had a bit of a man on me. Um, I was a, a huge Jim Morrison fan. I didn't kind of so much mimic his, what he would say. I just wanted to cause a ruckus like he would cause. And so yeah, I took aim at some fairly easy targets for the time. Stuff I'm not all that proud of that I'll probably never say again, but caused a bit of a, a stir. And then we went down to Sydney. And when we got down to, when we first started going down to Sydney, I didn't I missed a couple of meetings. So they build up this story. Oh, they put that, so where's the singer? Where's Dave? They go, oh, you don't you don't want Dave here. He's a bit of a loose cannon. So I had this this reputation built for me and I was more than <laughs> more than happy to play up to it. But uh, it was unreal. We'd go down to Sydney, reintroduce words. We used to say rock on and mega, oh, that's mega and all this stuff. And everyone thought we were like a throwback to the 70s, you know. And But the best part was when people would say, so where are you from? And say, we're from Newey. And they'd you'd see them like, oh, uh, new, new, yeah. And then, so we kind of we played up on that quite a bit, and yeah, yeah. And we had a very gang mentality when we were there. So I, I guess that kind of didn't ingratiate us too much to uh, other bands or uh, or record company people. But it was certainly we were a gang. There's no doubt about but, it. Uh, weren't there a, a few fights and tussles between massive followers from UE and your new followers from Sydney? Yeah, well, a few Barneys there. Eh? When we um, came to the the, the public's attention by uh, there was a Triple J National Battle of the Bands. So we made it, it was at Selena's once a month every Saturday night. We organized, used to organise busloads of people to go down there. We took like, we were taking 80, 100 people down to these shows right. and part of the, the judging was on crowd reaction. So we, we kind of had that nailed. When we won the National Battle of the Bands, the first band since Fraternity had been the, the previous band that had won it in 1972 was the last time they'd had a National Battle of the Bands and Bon Scott was one of the members of Fraternity at the time. There was a <laughs> big big thing of a rider like a big tub of beer and all that type of stuff and one of our mates picked it up and into our room right and these people banging on the door where's all the beer where's all the beer anyway Scottish who, who was a guy he looks out the door he goes oh shit we're, we're in trouble it was like all the, one one of the bands was a big Maori band and they were kind of oh. baying for blood he said what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the door hand this to him and you guys go that way right so it's exactly what he did open the door he kind of handed it to him pushed him that way made a, and we just all made a break down the other way <laughs> 
and ran off into the night like the cowards we were. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years later, who, who would have ever thought that you've released another great album, which is called Chrome, right? Yep, most recent one, Chrome. Racking album. Cheers, thank you. It's hard, you know, because over the years, people lose interest. The record by your, your fans kind of have kids and get married and get jobs and come to less gigs and all that type of stuff. For us, it, it's just so important to keep making new music I mean, although we do play better and help in hand and all those songs every time we play because yeah. that's something people expect you're, you're always you're constantly writing new material and trying to inspire yourselves and that kind of inspires yeah. others so i get a phone in to a school warner's bay public school about three weeks ago and i mentioned to them that i've been talking to your manager back to try and get you you know podcasting the whole six Grade, said he's a newy boy and <laughs> he's a 12 year old kid I, I love you mate you know yeah well uh, we, we certainly have a, a very loyal following and i can only put that down to good parenting um, <laughs> and we've always been very proud newcastle boys we uh although i haven't lived there for many many years it's still my sole place sole place yeah when you went on to do vocal coaching on it takes two you did it a couple of times who were your contestants firstly Kate Fisher it was 2004. We had a fantastic time together and I found it to be a, a lovely person. We had a great laugh. We used to hang out, break curfew, <laughs> break curfew and have parties in our rooms and stuff yeah, right. like that. So one time I actually got in trouble for having parties in my room because everyone was coming to my room. I'm like, well, I'm not making anyone come to my room. I get knocked on the door. Dave, what are you doing? I oh, no, let's have a party. So yeah, it was first with Kate and then wonderful Julia Zemiro. We did the wow. next season. And Julia is from uh, the ABC Rock Quiz. Rock Quiz, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great show too. I love my music. I, I grew up and took piano lessons. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, and I, and I love my music. Gee, the Rock Quiz was a great show too. Yeah, brilliant. It was, uh, I, she never got me on there. I was a little bit dirty about that. I tell a lie. They did a live Rock Quiz at Clipsal race down here one year and I'm, I was on that. Born to be wild. And you were. And mate, mate, you've done other TV shows. You did the footy show for a couple of years. You were the front man for that. 02 to 04. Yeah. Yeah, that was unreal because uh, that was just... The, so the Jets had been off the road. There's got to be an easier way to make a living. So I recorded a, uh, a solo album and Glenn Pallister, who was the longtime uh, producer of the footy show, a very good friend of mine and my wife, fantastic man. So I rang him up and I said, these are the exact words, I said, Glenn, I've got this album out. Can I come on and do a song maybe? He goes, Dave, it's your show. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can come on your show mate so that album you did was that Wanted Man yeah yeah so he booked me in to do it to, uh, in a couple of weeks I think that's right so he booked me in for a couple of weeks and then he rang me back a day later and said listen we're going to Orange or Bathurst or somewhere like that to do an, yep. an outside broadcast OB, yep. would you come along and sing with uh, with the Nevilles and I said oh, yeah sure no worries I went along there oh, it was Wagga Wagga that's right because it was Peter Sterling they did This Is Your Life Peter Sterling it was in oh. his Town. Oh, that's where that was where I first did standing in for the uh, singing with the Nevilles, and I thought they played whole songs, but they don't. They just play thirty seconds to the break. Uh, Tony Chalmers would go, "We're out," and the band would go. <laughs> like that they had to stop what? so they just play those bits on and off it's also I had um, headphones so I could hear what was going on while they were doing the This Is Your Life with Peter Sterling this guy's telling a really long winded story mate should have heard the producer will someone hook this so and so he said I can hear televisions turning off all over the country you know and I'm like oh classic this is what goes on behind the scenes I ended up uh, singing with the Nevilles for the next two years and Wow. Had a brilliant time. We went down the snow and toured around. It did a few different places where uh, outside broadcasts and that. It was a, it was great to be part of the team, hanging out with Maddie and oh, yeah. Fatty. And I said to Sterlo one time because they were always talking about golf. They always played golf, and I said to Sterlo, "Only chance I could get a Guernsey and come and play." He said, "Have you got lots of money?" And I said, "No." Nah. He said, "No." Nah. Don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've done a lot of touring as well with different people. Like you did one with um, King of Australian Country, Lee Kernigan. Yeah, I was very lucky that Lee, uh, when I bought out Wanted Man, I'd done all under my own steam with, uh, with Jimmy Hocking, who's a uh, Screaming Jets guitar player. I'm talking to Jimmy about you, actually, so we'll get to Jimmy a little bit later. All right, right yeah. Well, he, <laughs> yeah, well, that was a funny story because um, I was all set to record the album with someone else, but Jimmy was flying in. I had a falling out with 
the guy I was going to record the album with the day before we started recording. Send Jimmy a message. I say, mate, it's all off. Don't worry about coming up. He got back in touch with me. He said, well, look, you can come down here and do it. And within a week, I was down there and did the album at his place. And then when I had it all together, I don't know how I got in touch with Lee. It threw one, uh, uh, maybe his manager. His manager, um, Steve White. Steve White, yeah. 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 Some, uh, he took me on a tour, probably about eight or ten days. God bless him. He said to me, I, I could use three members out of his band. And so I had a wow. brilliant drummer uh, in in Rudy Miranda uh, or, and, and Mitch Farmer. I think they, they kind of mixed it between them. But James Gillard on bass, he played bass. He's just a, a brilliant, brilliant bass player. He plays with everyone. Brendan, can't remember his last name. He played guitar. But these guys were just absolute guns. And I walked in there. We did one rehearsal at Mittagong. They just nailed everything. And it, probably the best that it ever sounded. Because over the, the next six months, I put together bands of convenience, things like like, can you be here on this date? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, have, have you got a drum kit? Yeah, yeah, beautiful. You're in. That was kind of the process for rehearsals and stuff. I reckon in those six or eight months I had commitments and stuff came through and yep. I just had to keep circulating them. So we probably got the combination right four or five times over that period. You played in Tamworth and the Gimpy Muster as well. Where was the Gimpy Muster? The Gimpy Muster was absolutely wild. I mean, if anyone, uh, if you get a chance to go and, and, and experience it, people have the same sites every year in order to get those sites because obviously there's not much of a it's just in the bush people just go and set up their skeleton kind of area they'll have someone stay there and look after their site but actually when when all the sites are set up there's these really elaborate tent sites areas and stuff like that it's it's, it's an amazing place there's 10,000 people camped in the bush Jeez. a lot of Bundy going on but a lot of other things going on too it is yeah good. that's right we did probably three or four gigs there I do remember at one stage I knocked over a Someone bought me a rum and coke. I feel a bit sick telling this story, but I knocked it over on the stage that 600 other people had been on. And I went, oh, no, I've knocked me, me rum over. And so I got down and I started licking it up. Oh, so. <laughs> the things we do. Oh, I do remember looking up. And I saw my wife. She was talking to someone up the back and I just, I saw the look on her face. I thought, yeah, I might stop doing this. You get a bloody dressing down when you get off stage. That's yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, and I was uh, I was on stage once actually working on a cruise. I don't know how the subject came up. It was a 10 o'clock gig in the morning, 1,200 people in the audience. And I said to them, oh, yeah, you know, one day I might, uh, might just sit down and have a beer with you. Anyway, 10 minutes later, this guy comes back with two beers, two stewies. They're Chinese people. So we're sitting on stage and I'm having a bloody beer with him at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, that's what cruises are for, Jason. Oh, that's geez. what they're for. And if I drank too many, I would have been absolutely legless, mate. Let me tell you. <laughs> wow. Oh. We went on a cruise last year, the Rock the Boat cruise with the Angels. They sold five hundred one thousand dollar drink packages on the first day. Jeez. Now what happens is you have drink packages or allotment per day. If you go over that allotment, then you have to start paying for the drinks. But if you don't drink at all, it doesn't roll over to the next day. But so what happens is the first three or four, three days or whatever, people are into it, right? And then you see them on the fourth day, they're making themselves because they know not be drinking is going to cost them money. So they're like. <laughs> Seven o'clock in the morning. Oh, get in there, get in there. But uh, God bless them. I, I don't think many of them left any credit on on their drink vouchers when they There's left. Way in the world they would have done that, mate. Absolutely no way. In the world. <laughs> you also have been asked, and I think this is this would be a highlight to play the soundtrack from Mickey Rourke film. Well, this was, uh, I thought this was going to be big breakthrough. I think Don Johnson and Mickey Rourke, they did a movie called Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Man. The title should have been a bit of a giveaway for how bad this movie was going to be. They actually got Stop the World, Come On and Stop the World, both songs that I'd written. Yep. When they said, oh, you get the, this, these songs are going to be in this uh, massive American movie with two of the biggest Hollywood stars of the time in it. Yeah, yeah. I just thought, well, here we go. This is going to be awesome. Unfortunately, for anyone who's seen it, it is a, just a terrible, terrible movie. A cult following, though. It did get a cult following. Thing is, we got paid money at the time, but that was at the time we were just a fledgling band, so all the money kind of went back into the machine. So it wasn't like I got, oh, you got paid 50 grand for these songs. Do you want it? Like, it just kind of got funneled back into the machine. The only money I ever made in my own pocket that was away 
pay from the band was I did an ad for Sandboy Chips. Got paid like 35 grand over two years. So that was my payoff. And free Sandboys for the rest of your life. Free Sandboys. People would throw them at me on stage. And I'd go, nah, I think I need Sandboy Chips. I got, I got, they, pay, they pay me in Sandboy Chips. What's your favourite flavour? <laughs> salt and vinegar. Oh, oh, actually, Leanne loves salt and vinegar too. She sits there and licks them. Ugh. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I suck the salt and vinegar off them. I love them. Oh, do you really? You know, here's a bit of a tip for you. When you're deep frying fish, right, instead of using breadcrumbs or panko breadcrumbs, use salt and vinegar chips. Crush them up. Oh, I'd love it. I love it. I'm going to uh, give that a go. Unreal. Thanks for that. Yeah. Oh, I, I am a bit of a cook, so I'll, I'll give that a crack. Oh, that's good, because actually, that's one of my subjects. Hang on, something's coming from the kitchen. What did you say, like, I have a bad habit. When I eat um, chips like Sandboys or Smith's chips, I, I like Wayne one try. But I eat them, and I eat Cadbury Dairy Milk chocolate at the same time, right? It's a salt, and it's, it's like the sweet and savory type thing. Anyway, we found out in Japan, they have these called Royce chips. They're a crisp chip like a Sandboy, and they're dunked in chocolate. And you can get them in a so- caramel chocolate or a vanilla or a dark or just a plain, like, milk chocolate. And I... Oh, my. <laughs> well, see, I, I'm a bit of a fan myself. But I like French fries at Macca's and yep. dipping them in the, the hot fudge sundae and you get a bit of the ice cream and chocolate on it. That was my thing. No way. That's gross. My sister <laughs> used to do that. She used to have hot chips on Vegemite sandwiches. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, oh, what, what, about the, what about the chip sandwich? The hot chip I, sandwich? I, I love the chip sandwich. Also, you know what else I like? Fresh tomato bread roll, Smith's chips on it or Sandboy chips yeah, on right. it. Mate, again, well, that, Halty and Devon and tomato sauce. Oh, I mean, oh, that's my childhood right there. Devon and tomato. <laughs> Pex paste on toast. Pex paste. Oh, yeah. I remember that yeah. stuff. Deviled ham spread. Deviled ham spread. Here's my beautiful wife coming in now to show you something else. She's got honey and peanut butter together. <laughs> oh, well, uh, that's an El- that's an Elvis. That's an Elvis, Elvis was big on that. Elvis El- honey, peanut butter, and banana. Honey, and peanut bacon, butter, banana, and bacon. Please, I said. <laughs>